Okay, fantastic. So, um, yeah, so just, just check, check that everyone is where you expect to be. Um, this is a talk about Summits on the Air, the, uh, the Amateur Radio uh, Awards program, which has become really popular, and it's something that I'm really involved in. So um, for those of you who might not know me, uh, I'm Dom M0BLF. Um, sorry, just going to change something very quickly at this end, which has uh, magically stopped working annoyingly. Good. Okay. So, um, so yes, I'm Dom M0BLF. Um, for those who don't know me, I used to be a member of the Dartmoor Radio Club back when I lived in Yelverton as a teenager. I now live in Cambridge, but it's anyway. It's a great, op uh, great pleasure to be asked to give this talk on summits on the air to you all today, um, especially because I gather that a lot of you have become interested in SOTA fairly recently. So um, let's uh, make a proper start. Um, so first of all, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the main SOTA rules. Uh, that's kind of the, um, the talky bit, um, um, but it does play a big part in what SOTA is. I'm then going to discuss SOTA equipment a bit more, uh, including a bit of a show and tell on what I'm currently using on my own SOTA activations. And then finally, I'll run through a bit about how you can go about planning your own SOTA activations and what you need to do to claim your own SOTA points. Now, um, I'll try to make some time for questions at the end as well. So um, the first rule that you need to know about in terms of SOTA is about what a summit is, uh, because it's got a very definite definition. Um, in the UK and Ireland, it's the list of Marilyns. Uh, you may know that as a list of hills uh, that was put together some time ago. And as part of the definition for what a Marilyn is, the summit must have 150 metres of prominence above the surrounding land. And this is what's known in SOTA as the P150 rule. Uh, it basically means that if you take a map of the summit, you must be able to define a 150 metre drop on all sides from the highest point. So if there's a shoulder across to another hill, for example, uh, that other hill might not have the 150 metre drop off, so the other hill summit won't count. And I'm going to show you an example of uh, this right now. Um, if I just pause that for the moment and um, do that, and then do uh, sorry, do that. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, is the summit of Snowdon. Um, I've kind of put a red line around the 150 meter drop off point, and uh, so you can see kind of where the, where the summit is defined as being for SOTA. And you can see the sort of secondary peak next to it is inside that red line. So that won't count for SOTA. So if we just go, um, go back to my slides, one second. So that's, uh, that's what a summit is uh, for SOTA purposes. Um, so um, in the uh, the other thing that you need to know about uh, is that that's really important is something uh, called the um, oh the something about the points. Now the points you get in SOTA only reflect the spot height of the summit. Uh, that means that there are plenty of ten point summits that are really easy to activate because there's a road all the way to the top, and there's also plenty of one point summits that are hard to get to. Um, one I did in Scotland once required a couple of miles of walking through a bog before you even had started a hard scramble up the hill. So uh, never assume that points remotely reflect uh, difficulty in SOTA. Uh, they don't, as a general rule. Um, you'll find out, though, that it all averages out in the end. And so for every summit that's worth lots of points, there'll be a really horrible one where you struggle to just to get a couple points. Now, before I go on, the reason I stress the definition of a hill so much is that it has a really big impact on Dartmoor. Uh, if I uh, take uh, the highest point on the moor, High Will Hayes, uh, that's, um, uh, sorry, wrong button, um, that's got a summit at around 650 metres. If you draw the line that's 150 metres down from that, uh, that's marked with this red line here. And you'll see that most of the high moor 
is actually covered inside the red line, inside the prominent zone for high wheel haze. Um, basically, the hills on Dartmoor roll too much, so the hills don't get sufficient prominence, and that's why there's only one, uh, one summit on the air, uh, uh, hill on Dartmoor, sadly. So as well as the, uh, the prominence rule, the other thing that you uh, need to know about is uh, the activation zone rule. Um, what the activation zone rule says is, well, when we talk about activating SOTA summits, um, the ideal is that you should be at the top of the hill. But uh, if you take this example here, this photo I've taken of Triven in Snowdonia, the actual highest point of a mountain can actually be a very small area just on top of the rock there. Uh, not enough room to fit an antenna in. It may also be a very popular mountain, so it may be antisocial to set up actually at the top. So to deal with this by having a rule that you actually have to be within 25 meters vertically of the highest point, and this area is called the activation zone. Some hills will have a very large activation zone, which is lovely, and others are a bit of a struggle. And in very rare cases, the size of the activation zone may actually set you, um, stop you from setting up a very long dipole, for example. So it's important to check how big the activation zone is on a mountain before you leave, before you decide what equipment to take. It's also worth knowing, though, that if a summit is private property and therefore out of bounds, you may still be able to activate it by finding some public land that's within that activation zone. Um, so if I uh, go uh, across to a photo of, uh, of Snowden, uh, you can see an example of, of the activation zone, uh, which I've kind of marked in, uh, marked in yellow for you. The other thing you need to know about is uh, using a portable power source. You must use a portable power source, um, no fossil fuel generators for SOTA. Uh, that generally means these days that you'll be using uh, a lithium polymer battery uh, like this one. Um, and uh, the other thing you need to know is that you should aim, if possible, to walk into the activation zone. Now, this isn't a strict rule, and it's subject to some common sense at the local summit, but if it's possible, you should do it. So as an example, last year I did a hill with a road to the top. A friend was driving, uh, so I got him to drop me just outside of the activation zone uh, so that I could walk into the activation zone while he carried on by road. Uh, finally, you can't operate from a car or have any part of the uh, station equipment on a car, so no mobile antennas on the roof, for example. Uh, let's take a look at this in practice. Um, this is uh, Barak Freiture, which is a, a SOTA in Belgium, um, and it's a SOTA summit. You'll also notice it's basically a motorway service station. Um, in this case, you can make a reasonable case for not walking into the activation zone. Nobody's actually going to reasonably expect you to park on the carriageway and walk along the motorway. But once you've parked up at the cafe, uh, you can't operate from your car, so you need to get out and operate from your portable power source, uh, perhaps sitting at one of the benches at the cafe. OK, so you've climbed to the top of a hill. You now need to make some points to get a QSO. Uh, specifically, you need to make four, point, four QSOs to get the points for that hill. Um, and it doesn't matter who the person is. So if they're not a SOTA participant, it doesn't matter. Given the SOTA reference anyway, the contact is still valid. Uh, the other thing you need to know is that you can make SOTA contacts on any band and mode as long as it isn't via a repeater. So in particular, you're OK to make contacts on the WARC, the walk bands, which are traditionally contest free. And in fact, 60 meters is very popular for SOTA nationally. And I personally like 30 meters CW uh, because it's normally open to somewhere in Europe at most times of the day. If you've only got VHF gear, that's fine as well, as long as you're operating simplex. If you really wanted, you could take a laptop for FT8 to the top of the hill or a satellite antenna. Um, by the way, one of the reasons I generally use CW for HF SOTA activations is because you get so much more efficiency at low power from CW. Uh, with, uh, with voice on SSB, duty cycles are such that you're rarely operating at your rig's maximum power, which if you've only got 5 or 10 watts is uh, not ideal. 
If you live near to a particular SOTA summit, can you go up there several times a week perhaps and get loads and loads of points? Uh, no, I'm afraid you can't. Uh, activators are only allowed to claim points for a given summit once per calendar year. So you can only go to High Will Haze once in 2019 to claim the points for it. Uh, this is to encourage activators to travel around and find new places to climb, new hills, new places to go. Uh, if you are a chaser, however, that means you're sitting at home and you're actually talking to someone who's on the hill, uh, then you're allowed to claim the points once per day. Um, so that means you're sitting in your home shack, you hear someone on High Will Haze um, on 2 meters FM, so you're fine to claim the points for that hill once per day. Uh, and this is uh, set up so that it ensures that VHF operators should always be able to make contacts with the locals. Now obviously when the SOTA program was founded there was a risk it could have become a very good weather summer only activity and to avoid this the management team created the concept of seasonal bonus periods. Now in Europe we call these the winter bonus uh, and what that means is that each year from sometime around November to December until about the middle of March you can get extra points as an activator um, for being out in the cold conditions. Uh, now the exact rules do change by country but in England you get an extra three points for any hill over 500 meters above sea level between the 1st of December and the 15th of March. So that means if you want to get seven points for High Will Haze instead of the normal four in 2019 you either need to activate it in the next week or so before the 15th of March or wait until after the 1st of December. By the way, these are officially called seasonal bonuses instead of winter bonuses because in other parts of the world the bonus points are actually awarded for harsh midsummer conditions. Uh, so in California, for example, where it gets really very hot. Okay, next, uh, next thing to be aware of, P100 associations. Now this is uh, kind of the complicated bit and I wondered whether I should include it or not, but I've already said that to count for SOTA, a hill needs to have 150 metres of prominence, so it must rise uh, more than 150 metres above the surrounding uh, terrain. That's called the P150 rule. Now that's true for most places, but I also showed you a picture from Belgium, which is a very flat country. Uh, so it would struggle to get any P150 hills. In special cases, some countries are allowed to be declared P100 associations, which means the hills only need to have 100 metres of prominence to count. Uh, so that means that there are some places where you get more points for a specific height than other places. And in turn, this means a lot of SOTA activators will purposely travel to P100 countries to get a lot of points quicker. Now I've put a map of France on this slide because this is another interesting case. Um, in France a lot of the big mountains are in the east, so you've got the Alps, the central south, the Massif Central, and the southwest in the Pyrenees. Now those areas form a P150 association, but the result of that would be that the northwest of France would not have any valid SOTA summits under the P150 rule. So in this case France has basically had a diagonal line um, drawn through it from the southwest to the northeast, the area below that line with those big mountain ranges is a P150 association and the area north of that line is a P100 association and that means that there are accessible hills throughout France. Uh, so now that we've explained the difference between P100 and P150 associations I can actually start to talk about the points per metre and uh, as you see here uh, there are some substantial differences. Um, so a, a hill that is 460, sorry, 460 metres ASL uh, is only one point uh, if you're in a P150 association like England, but it's worth four points if you're in a P100 association like Belgium. Um, so that's again why people travel around. So uh, that's kind of a, a brief overview of the main rules for SOTA. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the equipment um, and particularly the equipment that I'm using on SOTA activations. And the first thing to say here really is start with the equipment you've got. Um, one of my main pieces of SOTA equipment is um, it's just a simple uh, VHF UHF handheld. It's not got the stock antenna, it's got a slightly better antenna. Um, this will work really, really well for SOTA uh, if you're on the top of a hill particularly if you're still in the Lake District, you've got uh, Liverpool and Manchester nearby, 
if you're in Snowdonia, you've got, again, Liverpool just over the water and also Dublin. Um, very easy to get to centres of population on, uh, on a basic handheld. If you uh, want to get a bit further, um, you can get something like a, one of these very portable HB9 CVs um, which, uh, or, or Sota Beams uh, Yagi uh, to go with that. Um, but uh, apart from that, I was just going to take you through the rest of the equipment in, uh, in my Sota kit. Um, everyone has some slightly different gear. Um, and the main point I would uh, I'd emphasize is that the more you do, the more you realize that things are heavy and you gradually optimize for weight. Um, there's no point in spending a whole load of money to start off with in SOTA, getting a whole new set of rigs, um, but you, you gradually, as you get more enthusiastic, you uh, drop down. So I started off using IC706. I was lugging up hills um, with one of these great big sealed lead acid battery packs and a great run of RG58 coax. Uh, I wouldn't do that anymore. Um, so the equipment I am using, well, I'm just actually going to run through my uh, my SOTA pack, um, the rucksack I have here. Um, this weighs about 8 kilograms, uh, uh, so 17 and a half pounds. So it's actually very, very manageable to take up a hill, and that includes sort of all the water and everything. So, uh, so yes, the um, it's important to remember when you're in hills, it's inherently dangerous. Um, you're going to be, uh, particularly if you're in mountainous areas, so the radio equipment is secondary to and not instead of any safety gear, any food, water, etc. obviously. So um, things in my soda pack, bag of water. Uh, in fact, let me clear that one out of the way uh, quickly. Yeah, so bag of water. Um, I've got um, a walking pole uh, so I can get up and down hills easily. There's a... Um, uh, SOTA pole. Now these are basically just fiberglass poles. Um, they are very, very easy. You just uh, extend them. They're telescopic. Um, this one's a, a uh, six or ten meter one. I can't remember which. Um, but it's very, very nice for holding up a lightweight wire antenna. Otherwise, again, on in terms of sort of safety type gear, um, wireless. Uh, sorry, a um, a whistle and a compass. I always take a paper map with me as well. If I'm going to be somewhere particularly dangerous, there is a, um, a satellite beacon on there for um, any emergencies. Uh, GPS a um, device for following paths, pen knife, etc. And there's even, again, for mountainous regions, I wouldn't take this everywhere, but even a, um, even a survival bag. Um, but the more interesting stuff is the radio gear. That's what I'm sure you're far more interested in. Um, and the radio gear fits in this little back, uh, little pack. This is an entire station in here. Um, so, and it weighs almost nothing. So uh, in here, what do we have? We have a logbook. Uh, this is a, a waterproof paper notepad. So. Um, you can write on it in the wind and the rain, and uh, it's it's very very resilient. Uh, write on it with pencils, which are also in here. Um, the microphone I fairly rarely actually use um, voice on sotas just because of the inefficiency, but there is a microphone in there. I've got a set of headphones uh, for listening to whoever I'm talking to. You don't want to be using speakers at the top of a hill because, uh, frankly, it gets very windy and you wouldn't be able to hear anything. Um, this is a, uh, a palm paddle. Um, unfortunately, palm stopped, uh, stopped uh, or ceased trading last year and are no longer around. But uh, these are wonderful, lightweight CW keys. They're magnetic, they sit on the rig um, and uh, very, very portable. And then the rig itself, I'm currently using an Elecraft KX2. Um, this is the rig. It's um, about 10 to 12 watts, depending on how hard you push it. Uh, 80 meters through to 10 meters. CW, SSB, even PSK and RUTI. It's got built-in encoders and decoders. Uh, so a very, very nice uh, little rig. Um, and there's an internal battery pack in this one, in fact, as well. So um, it's, uh, it should just turn on and come to life uh, without anything external. 
Um, so, uh, so that's uh, that's the rig and the um, the, the uh, microphones and CW key, etc. In terms of antennas, again, antennas all fit in this bag. So, what do we have in here? Um, first of all, I have um, some. Uh, this is the uh, this is the antenna itself. It's a linked dipole, uh, so it's a dipole. If I um, have these connectors open, it's a dipole for 30 meters. If I connect them up, it's a dipole for uh, for 20 meters. Uh, in fact, the other way around. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, you'll see it's got uh, some high visibility string on it. Obviously, if we're at the top of a hill. Um, we're going to have things in grass. There could be lots of other walkers hanging around. You don't want anyone tripping over things. You also want to be able to see it when you're packing down and you've got uh, everything lying on the floor. So uh, high visibility string. Again, you can get that from uh, from Soda Beams, the, uh, the shop. Um, also in here then is um, guying kit and um, also a run of coax. This is RQ174 coax. Incredibly lossy. Wouldn't not want to use this in a home shack. But uh, it's a very, very lightweight and wonderful soda. Um, also, bungees. Um, you never know quite what you're going to find at the top of a hill. Sometimes you can find a very useful fence that's inside the activation zone. If you find a fence inside the activation zone, don't bother putting up poles and guying kits and things like that. Uh, if you've got a bungee, you can just bungee onto the fence. And uh, it's uh, set, certainly saved me a lot of time setting up in the past. But I do also have things like uh, tent pegs and uh, even a uh, run of insulating tape because you never know quite what's going to happen. Uh, the guiding kit, as I say, that's, um, that's on here as well. Again, high visibility. What happens with this, and I've got a, a spare here, is that the, uh, the string is attached to uh, the corners of the triangle. The soda pole goes up through the middle and uh, it just sits and forms a nice guiding ring. So. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of the very, very portable uh, SOTA equipment that, that I am now running. So uh, with that, let's um, go on to talk about uh, your first SOTA activation. Um, so uh, this is a, you'll, you'll want to go out and actually activate a hill. Let's talk about actually organizing that climb. You're going to need to plan a route, first of all. Um, and there are some fantastic resources. Um, other SOTA activators, including myself, often um, write up our own trips on our own blogs. So you can find out things like, is there a fence at the top? How big is the activation zone? Things like that. And even some photographs before you go. One of the most useful is the SOTA mapping project. Um, it's a separate website. But from there, you can download GPS tracks that other activators have taken, have um, recorded as they've walked up SOTA summits. So you can save those tracks onto your own GPS device, and that way you can literally walk in other people's footsteps. Even with that technology, though, I do still insist on having a paper map and compass with me, just uh, in case that things go wrong. You know, batteries run out at the end of the day. When you're planning your trip, don't forget that uh, SOTA points only relate, as I said earlier, to height and not difficulty. Even if it's, or especially if it's just a one or two pointer hill, do check the access, do check the contour lines on the map, uh, because it may be an awful lot harder than you think it's going to be. Um, again, I will always plan typically to um, for more than one hill in an area. So if things go wrong, if uh, I'm later than expected, if the weather's bad or whatever, I always have fallback options and I can say, right, I'm not going to do this uh, this difficult hill, I'm going to do that easy one instead. Uh, one main tip, especially if you have wire antennas and SOTA poles and the like, is practice putting them up in your own garden on a sunny day a few times before you head out. Um, it's a lot easier to know what you need to do and how to get it up quickly. Um, when you're in under nice conditions than to try making the mistakes for the first time or leaving something at home on a bitterly icy, bitterly cold icy summit after several miles of walk. Um, and once your trip is planned, um, you should sign up to the SOTA Watch website and put up what's called an alert. Uh, this lets everyone know where you plan to be and when you plan to be there. Now, you don't have to do this, but it does help to ensure that any chasers who might need that hill um, are listening for you. 
There's another reason for doing that as well, for putting up that alert, which uh, we'll come on to in a moment, that's especially relevant if you're an HF uh, Morse operator like myself. Now, before we go on uh, too much more, it's probably useful for you to know where your local uh, SOTA summits are. And uh, this is from the SOTA mapping project. Um, I've mentioned High Will Haze a couple of times. It's uh, your local Four Point Hill. Um, but you can also see that Kit Hill is a summit, as is Brown Willie on Bodmin Moor. Um, and in the other direction, there is Christ Cross just outside of Exeter. Um, I've personally activated all of those. They're absolutely fine to do. Uh, there's a couple more hills further into Cornwall, which I haven't actually got to yet myself. Um, when, you've, uh, when you've done all of that and you're ready to pack, uh, you need to actually put all your equipment together. Um, you saw some of my equipment a moment ago. This is my packing list, effectively, which you have just seen most of. Uh, the only thing I'm going to reiterate here is that your radio equipment is in addition to and not instead of safety gear, food and water. Um, now, when you're on the top of the hill, you'll uh, hopefully get spotted on what's known as the SOTA Watch Spots website. Um, this is different from the main DX cluster and uh, it only lists SOTA activations. So uh, if, you've got, uh, if you've also got a smartphone with a data signal, you can also spot yourself using the SOTA Spotter app. And again, this is all in aid of making sure the chasers can find the frequency that you're on uh, on the hill. Even better, and this is where I mentioned the alerts a moment ago, is that if you're doing CW on HF, you don't actually need to spot yourself at all. Uh, there's a very clever link between SOTA and the Reverse Beacon Network, which you may have heard of before. It's a global network of radios that are constantly decoding all the CW on the amateur bands. Um, provided you're on the hill within about 30 to 40 minutes or so of the time that you put in your SOTA alert before you set out, um, if, your, if your call sign gets heard with a CQ by the Reverse Beacon Network uh, in CW, it immediately results in a spot going up on the SOTA watch uh, spots, so uh, on your operating frequency. So you don't actually need to do anything. You call CQ, and literally within uh, one or two CQ calls, you'll be on the SOTA spots, um, spots website, and you'll start getting contacts. Uh, when you're making contacts, you should, in theory, give the uh, SOTA reference, but that isn't always possible in a pile app. Um, you do need to give your a signal report. Um, and uh, above all, don't lose the logo in a gust of wind over the side of the mountain when you're packing up. Uh, it's happened to all of us, um, and many operators will actually take a photo of the log uh, at the end of their activation just in case. Um, personally, I wouldn't recommend trying to log on any form of electronic device in bad weather. It's just going to be absolutely horrible. Waterproof notebooks and pencils are fairly resilient to any weather you can throw at them. Uh, so um, here is uh, a couple of weeks ago my uh, my own personal SOTA kit in action on a hill uh, that was in Madeira uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, when you return from your activation, you should enter your log into the SOTA data website. Now, by the way, I should say that unfortunately all of the websites I've mentioned so far, SOTA mapping project, SOTA alerts, SOTA data, and also the SOTA shop where you get certificates and awards from, uh, sadly, they're all separate websites and they all have their separate logins, so you do need to register for a different password on each site individually. It's a bit of a drag. Unfortunately, it's historical. Um, so um, when, you've, uh, when you've got your log up there and you've, um, and you've started making points, you can claim certificates from 100 activator points upwards. Uh, this is my 500 uh, certificate, which I got last year. Uh, your points never actually expire, so you just keep on collecting them uh, activation after activation, year after year, and they gradually accumulate. Um, and wherever you are, um, even, if, even if I go to operate from France or Belgium, it all, con it all contributes to my England score. Um, from 1,000 points onwards, you can actually claim the SOTA Mountain Goat Trophy. Uh, it's a serious achievement getting that, um, and it's a fantastic piece of glassware. If you're sitting at home and you're the person making contacts with people uh, on the tops of hills, you can also get certificates and uh, the Shack Sloth Trophy. 
and uh, with that that should now explain uh, the title of this talk so why the goat reference well because I'm now at over 500 points I am now a half goat <laughs> so um, but just before we finish, uh, why do I think that SOTA has grown so much since it started in 2002? Why do I think it's so popular? Um, I think there's a few key reasons. First of all, it uh, it gets us out of the shack. So I clicked the wrong button. I meant to do that one. Um, uh, it gets us out of the shack into the open country. We can go and get exercise. And of course, radio gear typically works much more efficiently on the top of a hill than it does in a valley. Um, by getting away from the shack, though, we're also getting away from high suburban noise levels. Uh, here in my home on the outskirts of Cambridge, 40 metres is a complete write-off. It's just about unusable. Um, and uh, my garden isn't big enough for any form of large, uh, larger HF antenna. Um, so that's fairly typical. These are really common problems. Uh, SOTA is a really nice way of getting out, that, out of that problem by getting us away from uh, noise sources and into larger spaces. So it has also really been enabled by LiPo battery technology um, and it continues to push manufacturers to come up with smaller, much lighter rigs like that Elecraft KX2 I showed you. And finally, SOTA is a great opportunity to show off the hobby to people. And um, people do come and ask what you're doing when you're sitting on top of a mountain with a load of equipment and a big pole next to you. And they're generally amazed if you say that you've just spoken to someone in Poland or the Czech Republic using just what you can carry on your backpack. Uh, and if you go to the SOTA website, you can actually um, download excuse me, one of these leaflets um, which tell, you all, tell people all about amateur radio and SOTA. So you can print these out before you go and give them to anyone who becomes interested in the hobby while you're talking to them. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of all I have. I think I've been talking for roughly half an hour. So, um, so with that, are there any questions from anyone? Uh, well, if I can start it off, uh, Dominic, yeah. it's uh, Alan, G4BLI. Hi, Alan. Um, hi. I was uh, wondering, you know, the, the paddles that you, uh, you, you say that are no longer available, doesn't uh, Elecraft have paddles that go on to the KX2 and the KX3? They do, absolutely, yes. Yes, uh, they, um, the KX2 and the KX3 have uh, kind of screw holes in the front uh, that, uh, that will actually take a, a special, um, uh, either a, a, their own key or you could get uh, adapters that, uh, that actually took the palm keys as well. Um, but yes, you, you can get keys directly from Elecraft. They are slightly overpriced, as is a lot of Elecraft kits, sadly. Yes, quite. Yeah. Um, what about the batteries? Can you, can you hear me, Dominic? Yeah, yeah I can, yeah. yeah. Oh. The batteries that you use are they're lithium and not LiPos, are they? Yeah, so um, I'm so inside the KX2 I have uh, LiPo. Um, that one typically, what do I get out of it? The the KX2 is lovely because it will run down to about nine volts quite happily. Um, I can typically get probably a couple of hours of operation out of the LiPos in the KX2. Um, the larger battery pack I showed you a moment ago, uh, this one is actually a lithium ion polymer, so a LiPo battery. Um, it's a little more, little less power per um, power out of it um, per cell, but on the other hand, it's uh, slightly more stable than a LiPo and not so likely to to explode on you. Is that a four cell one? Is it? Uh, this one is. This one's a four cell one. Yes, it's a. Uh, 4,200 uh, 4, milliamp hours. Wow. Okay, thank you, Dominic. Tough. Anybody else got some questions at all? Uh, in Scotland, have you been up on the Mon done the Monroes? You've been up there? Um, I've done a couple of uh, the Scottish hills, typically in the Hebrides. There's um, th there's lots lots of the Hebrides um, islands have hills on them. Um, I haven't done too much in in the mainland, going going up into the highlands. It's kind of still on the to-do list. When you go to Svalbard, do you go, do you go back up there? Will you be, have you done any up there? Uh, no. Um, so one, one, of the, one of the things I should perhaps have said, I can't remember whether even Svalbard has any SOTAs on it. Um, and one of the things I should have said perhaps is that uh, the way SOTA was organised is it learnt from a lot of the problems of DXCC and IOTA, which is having to have a central committee that decided what things count and what things don't count. Um, 
and having people in in England trying to make rules about islands in the Pacific kind of doesn't make very much sense. So the way the way SOTA dealt with it is by setting up what's what's known as these associations, which more or less map to map to countries, um, and then a regional manager, an association manager for that association, is the person who decides on things like the prominence rule, which hills in their own country are going to count. And this way, it's entirely decentralized. The flip side of that, mo though, means that if there isn't a local who is willing to take on that job, SOTA doesn't exist in that country. Um, and it, I have a feeling that Svalbard is one of the cases where there, there may not be a, an association manager, and therefore there isn't SOTA in, um, in Svalbard, as far as I remember. Can you remember the last time you were indoors? <laughs> um, right now. <laughs> don't don't be fooled by the background. How yeah. does Sota chap come down to the rally last year? Yeah. And I remember at the end of the day, his wife said, "I don't know if you if you'll make enough money to make it worthwhile coming round right down." I know when he finished the day, he said, "Well, now I've got enough to have a meal." But he then, having finished the rally on the Monday, he then went up somewhere locally. So he must have gone up to Brad Willey's, I suppose. Did I was asking him actually? He was they were very helpful actually. Very good. Excellent, good. Yeah, um, um, yeah. As I say, it, it's a bit of a shame that the Dartmoor uh, suffers from from not having uh, very much in the way of hills that count um, because of this prominence rule. But, uh, but yes, no, it's uh, it's lovely. And, and at some point in the summer, I will uh, I will no doubt be down and and try and tackle some of the hills myself. Um, it's uh, um, certainly High Willows is um, as long as you check the firing notice first is is a lovely and very easy hill to do. <laughs> yes. Sir. If you, get stuck, if you get stuck with any of the rules, Dominic, don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> so do people go up on their usually go up on their own? It's just just one solitary person, I suppose. Um, it depends. Um, I there are. I, I, I do a mix of things. So that I have a few friends who are interested in SOTAs. Sometimes we will go up on our own. Um, sometimes we'll go up as a group. If you get too big a group, it becomes a bit difficult, actually, because the likelihood of anyone being able to get four QSOs, um, a bit, for everyone to get the four QSOs they need to make get points, starts to make the day quite long if you've got a big group and that everyone's got to get four QSOs. So um, there can be too many people, um, but, uh, but a, a, sm a small group works really well. And there are some hills probably where I wouldn't want to do them on my own, just, just from a safety point of view. Does it does it act if you if one person goes up on their own and then then you will, because they've registered where they're going and then there's a, a problem. I'm not saying there's a rescue service, but I suppose there's some sort of contact they can then make to get themselves back down to safety. Has that happened at all? Do you know? Uh, I don't know whether that's happened. I, ideally, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to act uh, rely on amateur radio. Uh, at least in a serendipitous situation, as a rescue means. Um, if you, you know, I've I've been in cases before where there has been someone in a valley who's known where I'm going. It's perfectly fine for SOTA to make skeds with people. So you know, if you if you know some locals um, who are going to be hanging around, then it's absolutely fine to say, I'm going up this hill. Can you make contact with me from the top? You know, and uh, in those circumstances, then that might help. Um, one of the problems you can have, actually, though, is going up a hill. Obviously, you can end up being in the shadow of the hill itself. So again, I wouldn't want to rely on well on any individual mechanism for uh, for calling for help, which is uh, why I have the mix of my own my own phone, the amateur radio gear, and uh, if I'm particularly somewhere obscure, the satellite beacon. Thank you. Well, would you like the phone number of the local Raynet guy? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'm a member of Raynet myself. They they uh, they are very very good. They do a lot of good stuff. Um, but again, I um, if I were out walking, um, I would much prefer the Dartmoor Rescue Group to Raynet, perhaps. Hey. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Struck a chord there, Dominic. Yeah, well done. <laughs> well, I'm sure that we've got lots more to talk about as a result of SOTA. But what I didn't know was the uh, the spotting mechanism that went on. That's much much better, really. And also that you're allowed to make skeds. That's even that's even better still. So, yeah, um, I've got four points so far. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I mean, what what what? Even if even if you yourselves don't get out and and aren't able to do SOTAs, I would certainly encourage you to um, keep a, keep a rough eye on on that SOTA watch website. Perhaps if it particularly if it's a, a a good weekend coming up, and just see if there's anyone who's saying they're coming down to to Devon because. Uh, 
you know, if, if you can get on two meters, then uh, it's, it's one out of four QSOs for someone potentially. That's good. Uh, and finally, uh, Dominic, I don't want to hold you too long, but um, what's the main website that we should sort of uh, gain? That is an excellent question because it is on the next slide, which I forgot to put up. Um, so if I do, sorry, uh, if I do that. Um, so there are f five websites there. Um, the main site is sota.org.uk. Um, and then you've got the separate websites for the SOTA mapping project, for um, the SOTA data, which is where you put your logs, and the shop where you get certificates from, and then SOTA Beams, which is technically a separate company, um, but that's, that's where you get things like the poles and the guying kits and, and uh, that sort of equipment from. Well, we, we've got uh, Terry, who's, uh, who's uh, quite a... Um uh, a follower of uh, Sota Beams, he's got quite a number of bits and pieces, and he uses it uh, in the uh, uh, in the field quite a lot. So uh, at least he'll be able to tell anybody else who wants to know uh, about those about Sota products, at least. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, yeah, thanks very much for your attention, and uh, I say uh, a real pleasure to talk to you this evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.